in this lecture we will be talking about a single layer net network which is referred to as a perceptron before we discuss the perceptron we'll set up two important problems which we will be discussing throughout this course which are the binary classification and linear regression problems in the binary classification problem uh, you have training pairs and each training pair contains feature variables so you have a feature uh, feature vector with d dimensions so you have x bar so i have over bar as a notation used throughout this course whenever you are using a vector and it has d dimensions denoted by x1 through xd Uh, along with the feature variables you have a label y which is drawn from minus 1 or plus 1 so to give you a specific example of the binary classification problem you might have for example an email spam detection application in this case the feature variables might be the frequencies of the words so x1 through xt might be the frequencies of your d words in a lexicon and the class variable might be an indicator of whether or not that email is a spam So the, so the idea really here is that given labeled emails you want to build a training model so that for an unlabeled email you can recognize the incoming spam <clears throat> in linear regression the main difference is that your dependent variable y is real valued note that we are calling it a dependent variable rather than a label in this case so uh, in this so so just to give you an example in this case the feature variables could be the frequencies of the words in a web page and the dependent variable could be a prediction of number of accesses in a fixed fixed period so you might have training data giving historical information about web pages and their accesses and for a new web page you might want to deter, estimate how many accesses it is going to get in a fixed period now the perceptron is designed for the binary setting so that is what we are going to look at in this uh, Uh, in this video <clears throat> so the perceptron is an architecture which co with considerable historical significance it is what started off neural networks from a practical point of view so it was proposed by rosenblatt in 1958 and essentially it's a linear model so the idea really here is that you represent this linear models in the form of an architecture so as you can see this architecture contains two layers one is the input layer and Uh, you have an output layer which contains a single output node now the input layer has as many input nodes as the number of features so for example here you can clearly see that your data set contains five dimensions so you have five features <coughs> and the parameters of your model uh, you have one parameter associated with each feature so the number of parameters is equal to the number of features in in this class of models and then you have a output node at which the computation is performed now note that the at the input nodes no competition is performed all they do is they transmit the inputs and the output node what it does it, it takes those inputs multiplies them by the weight on the edge joining the input and the output node adds them up now note that you have a summation sign within the output node which tells you that it's adding up those values and then you have another uh, sign Uh, activation so th that is the other symbol inside the output node which is your activation function so the idea really here is that it's going to take the inputs multiply them take the dot product with the weight vector and then take the sign of that so if, if the sign of that is positive it's going to predict a plus 1 and if the sign is negative it's going to predict a minus 1 so that's how it's going to give you your binary label predictions <clears throat> so what is the perceptron really doing what the perceptron really does is that it tries to find a linear separator between the two classes so ideally uh, what you want to do is that you want to learn a weight vector w which is such that all positive instances that is all instances satisfying y is equal to 1 should be on the side of separators satisfying the dot product of w and x is greater than 0 so when you take the sign of that you will get the correct prediction of plus 1 and similarly all negative instances for which the uh, in the training data for which the observed uh, labels are minus 1 they should be on the side of separator satisfying the dot product between w and x is less than 0 so when you take the sign of that you'll get the correct prediction of minus 1 <clears throat> so this is a classical linear model where you're trying to find a hyperplane separating the two classes now uh, in many applications uh, you will need an additional input known as the bias why do you need the bias so for example in your spam detection application what's going to happen is that typically the number of 
um, uh, non-spam emails will be far larger than the number of spam emails. So typically you'll have a skewed class distribution. So what's going to happen in many of these cases is that there will be an invariant part of the prediction which cannot be captured by just taking the dot product of the parameter vector with a set of features that vary from instance to instance. So you need a constant value B added to the prediction which also needs to be learned. So the value of B also needs to be learned. And the way you can do it really is that you can add a bias neuron. So the idea really here is that bias neuron always is always on. So it, it always has an input of plus one and the weight of the edge joining the bias neuron and the output node is B, which is also a parameter that needs to be learned. Now, this B, you can really uh, rename it as W of D plus one. So it's the D plus one at weight. And then you can see that the form of this prediction is identical to the case of the Perceptron we discussed two slides back. The only difference is that, is that now we have D plus one inputs rather than D inputs. So this is a standard feature engineering trick which is always used for incorporating bias. It doesn't change the learning in any significant way. So very often what you'll see throughout this course is that the architectural diagram does not show the bias neuron explicitly, but it's often implicit in the architectural diagrams. And in fact, it's often important to use the bias uh, in most learning models. Uh, because uh, it, it is essentially in modeling a very important part of the prediction, especially when the amount of data is limited. <clears throat> so how do you train a perceptron? So the, so the way in which you train a perceptron is that you go through the input-output pairs, that x, y, one by one, and make updates. If the predicted value y hat is different from the observed value y. Now, if you recall, this is very similar to the biological readjustment of synaptic weights. In fact, when the perceptron was originally proposed, it was proposed within the context of this kind of biological interpretation. So the idea really here is that note that both the predicted values and the observed values are drawn from one and minus one. So y minus y hat, uh, if it is zero, then you're not going to make any update. Okay, because the predicted value is equal to the observed value. On the other hand, if they are different, then in that case you have an error, which is y minus y hat, and you are going to make an update, uh, which is w is equal to w plus alpha y minus y hat uh, multiplied by x bar. Now, one observation here is that both y and y hat are drawn from 1 and minus 1. So you can easily show that when y and y hat are different, y minus y hat is actually equal to 2y. So very often you write the updates in this compressed form, uh, which is uh, the, the lower equation, which shows w is equal to w plus 2 alpha y x bar. Now this factor of 2, usually you can drop it because it can, absorb with, it can be absorbed within the, within the parameter alpha. Now this parameter alpha is essentially the learning rate. The learning rate is very important in most neural network models. The perceptron is a notable exception in which the learning rate doesn't really matter. So what happens is that in the perceptron, the learning rate is irrelevant because it only has a scaling effect on the weights. So, uh, so essentially, uh, what you do in the perceptron is that you use these uh, errors in order to perform the updates of the weights, and one cycle through the entire training data set is, uh, you, you, you go through the points one by one to make the update, and one cycle through the tr entire training data set is referred to as an epoch. And typically, to train the perceptron, multiple epochs will be required. Now, one point that I have not yet discussed is how did we actually derive these updates? I haven't actually discussed how we have derived these uh, updates because uh, in, in the years that the perceptron was proposed, the, these notions of loss functions were not popular. So actually these updates, they were derived heuristically if you look at the original paper, but they did have a proof of convergence where they showed why these updates were, de were desirable and, and under certain conditions, they were guaranteed to find the optimal solution. Later on, people looked at this problem from the perspective of loss functions, which are what are used in traditional machine learning. In fact, in all of neural networks, the notion of loss function is very important. So the perceptron essentially optimized the perceptron criterion, which is a loss function, which is given by uh, this formula that is shown in the slide. So this loss function, what does it really tell us? It really tells us that 
our current parameter vector w, the parameter vector we are trying to find, how far is it from a desired solution? So essentially, uh, here you can see that this perceptron criterion is zero when w when the dot product of w x has the same sign as y i. So so why is that? Essentially, if you take the dot product w and x i and it's positive and y i is also positive, then minus y i multiplied w x i will become negative and the max of that and zero will always be zero. So the loss will be zero. So it's only for misclassified training instances that. Uh, this loss function value is positive and in fact the larger the, the, the absolute value of WXI the larger the loss will be because it kind of tells you how far away is that particular classification from the hyperplane uh, of separation. So, so what, the what does the perceptron updates do? What it really tries to do is that it tries to minimize this loss function. It, it tries to perform gradient descent okay so that the uh, ideally the loss function over the training instances is zero so if you work out the details of the updates i showed in the last, last slide you can show that they are equivalent to taking the weight vector and subtracting the gradient with respect to the weights multiplied by the learning rate alpha now perceptrons have a neat relationship with linear SVMs. Now you can see that the perceptron criterion in the previous slide minus yi multiplied by wxi. Now if I add 1 to that value and you make it 1 minus yi w uh, multiplied by wxi, you suddenly get what is called the hinge loss in the SVM. So essentially the hinge loss is very very similar to the perceptron criterion. What does this mean in terms of the relationship between their learning algorithms? What you can show is that the learning algorithms, the primal learning algorithms for an SVM and the learning algorithm for a perceptron are actually very similar. The only difference is the precondition in which you make an update. So in the perceptron, you update only when a misclassification occurs. That means that when the product of the labels and WXI they are of different sign and the product is negative, so the, the negative of that is positive. On the other hand, in linear SVM, you update uh, not only when a misclassification occurs, but when a classification is barely correct. So the idea really here is that their product, not only has uh, product of YI and WXI, not only has uh, does it have to be greater than zero, it has to be significantly greater than zero. Okay, it has to be greater than one. Only in that case, you won't make an update. Otherwise, you have to make an update. So the, the idea really here is that, is that the SVM has a notion of margin and it discourages even correctly classi classified training instances near the decision boundary. Otherwise, if you actually look at the form of the updates, the primal updates, they are identical between the linear SVM and the perceptron. So what does this difference mean in terms of the final solution found by the perceptron on the SVM? So you can actually show that in the case of the SVM, often you can your, your final solution can have a marginally correct prediction. So uh, on the left hand side in the figure there, you can see that there's an example of a training instance which is a marginally correct uh, prediction. And that can happen in a perceptron. However, in a linear SVM, the moment it will see a point like that, it will again update the separator until it finds a, and it will try to find a separator which is such that all the instances are on the correct side at sufficient distance. Of course, it, that may not always be possible depending on the nature of your training data distribution. So that brings us to the brings us to the point as to what kinds of training data sets do, does the perceptron and the linear SVM fail on. So as it turns out, the perceptron uh, works on a very restricted class of data distribution. So it works on those data distribution which are linearly separable. So here I have shown you uh, an example of a data distribution on the left hand side where the two classes are linearly separable. That means you can find the hyperplane uh, such that uh, the, the, the two classes are on either side of it. Now, even for data sets which are not linearly separable, it can classify approximately, but there will always be some error. So for example, if you look at the data distribution on the right hand side, that's not linearly separable. There, it is not possible to find a linear separator that cleanly separates the two classes. So how does one classify such data sets with neural networks? So there are two solutions that 
uh, one can use. One is a classical solution is that you can use feature engineering with radial basis function network. This is a very old type of neural network which is essentially very similar to a kernel SVM and this is good for noisy type of data. Now the deep learning solution is to use multi-layer networks with non-linear activation. So the idea really here is that this is good for data uh, with a lot of structures and this is the modern solution which is used in neural networks and most of our course will be on the second type of networks.